I'm going to start our recording um, and let you guys know, um, introduce myself. My name is Christy Balraj. I am with Partners Resource Network. We are the Parent Training and Information Center for the state of Texas. Um, our job is to make sure parents are um, educated and feel empowered to be the strongest advocate that they can for their kiddos throughout the process of uh, schooling and after schooling. We work with kids age zero to 26 with disabilities, working to make them advocates or stronger advocates for themselves also. Um, we want to make sure that um, if you have any questions, I know you could be joining us from any part of the state. If you have any questions, you feel free to let me know. I can get you in touch with your regional coordinator. Um, moving forward, my name is Christy Balraj, and I do appreciate you spending some time with us today. Um, here is my contact information and my phone number. Um, we will also be giving you um, Allison's contact information and phone number. I believe she already put that in the chat. Um, so these are just a few of the things that we do here at Partners Resource Network. So we've got about a minute left, Allison, until it's uh, 12 o'clock. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, let you introduce yourself. I know I am super excited about us hosting you today. Um, because I have had a ton of people asking for this information. So please, I'm turning it over to you. And I will Thanks, Chrissy. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having us today. It's a pleasure uh, to partner with you and your team. We have partnered with um, other regions all across the state. And so I think this is our first one with you. So we're happy to be here. Um, so for those of um, you just joining, today's um, presentation is being recorded and um, following the presentation today, we are, um, we are gonna put an email. Um, you, you guys are gonna get a PDF of today's slides. So any links that are in there or whatever, you're gonna have those um, at your fingertips so you can just focus. You don't have to take copious notes. Um, you're gonna get this. And also, um, you'll also get a recording and any other attachments or anything like that that we talk about to, in today's um, presentation, we're gonna um, submit that uh, to you as well. So um, Allison Scalberg here with Consolidated Planning Group. Uh, Consolidated Planning Group is a holistic special needs financial planning firm. Uh, we are located um, outside of basically the greater Houston area, but we serve um, special needs families all across the U.S., all across Texas. Um, and so, um, you know, it's funny how the pandemic changes things, like it changes how we work and how we think and things like that. And um, and so uh, basically, I, I, I guess at the beginning of the pandemic, we really started being really, really proactive on the webinars that we were putting out to, to families. But how this was really all born, um, I am a parent to four. I have two kids with special needs. I have one child that is transitioning. She's turning 18 next month. I know, it's shocking. I can't believe that is the baby. Um, and, then, and then I have another child that transitioned um, a few years ago. And what I will tell you, is um, professionally, I eat, sleep, and breathe this. Personally, I eat, sleep, and breathe this, right? And so what I will tell you is um, things are hard. When we were doing this transition process with, um, with my older daughter, um, I found that the process in itself of everything that um, you have to know and ifs and buts and crossing your T's and dotting your I's and saying the wrong thing and all of these things just bubbling up, it was just a little overwhelming. And, and I do this for a living, right? And so I think that that was kind of what really prompted um, putting out these series of webinars on topics related to special needs, um, special needs planning special needs transitioning, um, et cetera. So um, Consolidated Planning Group, we do have a YouTube channel out there and our past recordings live out there. We're gonna talk about a variety of topics today. And basically if there is any um, depth to any one of those topics, there is an entire YouTube video about that particular topic. Um, so today, um, what we're gonna be talking about is um, Medicaid waivers, SSI eligibility, preserving benefits, et cetera. Um, 
I just want to remind everybody that um, Christy's going to be monitoring the chat box. So we definitely want you to put your questions in the chat box and we're going to get to just as many as we can. We're going to do that interactive. So don't um, necessarily save your questions to the end. We can't see you and we can't hear you, but we do know you're there. Um, so definitely, definitely interact with us. Um, okay, so buzzword. It's like, you know, the list, the interest list. Is your child on the list? Um, are they on the waiver list? Are they, there, there's so many different ways that people go about asking about this, this list. And, um, and the truth is, is there are um, a number of Medicaid waivers in the state of Texas, and some people know about them and some people don't. Um, some some folks think that their their child is on all of the state interest list, and in fact, they might only be on a few. So we're going to talk about the different um, interest lists today. Um, how do you go about getting on these lists? How do you check your eligible? How do you check, you know, kind of where you are on the list? We're going to kind of go deep and wide with some of these things. So um, today, so as we get started, we're going to just kind of name off some of these um, waivers that we've um, that that we're talking about: the Texas Me Medicaid Home and Community-Based Waivers. So. Ultimately, we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but ultimately what these waivers are designed to do is, is waive off some type of care. So our waive off the necessity of uh, institutional or residential living, it, it, most of them. So, um, so we've got the Community Living Assistance and Support Services. This is also known as CLASS. We like acronyms in the state of Texas, so um, we went ahead and put the acronyms on here. In case you don't know, uh, it's important to know because the people throw them around like it's just a regular old language, and if you're new to this, um, it's hard to navigate some of this. We've got the deaf blind with multiple disabilities, DBMD. That's always a mouthful for me. We have the home and community-based services. We hear about this one a lot, HCS. We have Texas Home Living. Uh, TXHML. We have the Medically Dependent Children's Program, MDCP. We have the STAR Plus waiver. We have the Youth Empowerment Services, also known as the YES waiver, and Community First Choice also, and we don't have that on there, but uh, CFC, okay? So, um, so kind of going a little bit deeper and wider on some of these. Now, one of the websites, and I, and you could type this in the chat box, Christy, if you wanted. Um, it's the HHS website. Um, so, HHS website has a lot of um, a lot of details on the waivers in the state of Texas. So, that's a good place to go and check it out. Um, another um, place is Navigate Life Texas. Navigate Life Texas is also another good website uh, that has a lot of information on a variety of to topics for um, special needs loved ones, but it does talk about the waivers as well. So getting going on the class waiver, this is going to give home and community-based um, supports to children and adults with related conditions. There's over 200 related conditions like cerebral palsy, spina bifida. The related condition must have occurred prior to the child turning 22. How are we on the chat box? Are we okay, Christy? Yes, ma'am. We did have one question about, um, actually a couple of questions. One was about food stamps. Um, and getting food stamps under their child's name? It's a complicated process for food stamps. Um, so again, back on the HHS website, you can apply um, for, uh, you can go through and apply for that um, on their website. But if it's your child, um, it's going to take into consideration the, par the parent's income. So most oftentimes, um, if parents are working, they won't qualify for food stamps. Once the child turns 18, it's based off of, uh, of their income and assets, not the parents. Now, it can be convoluted if the person is still living at home versus outside of the home, but we have seen, seen it covered. But again, it is based off of the, the child's uh, income and assets, excuse me, the adult income and assets until the child turns 18. So that's why oftentimes people don't qualify. But that website's pretty good. Um, and you create an account 
and like a username and password and you put in all of your information and the website basically tells you the programs in the state of Texas that you may be able to qualify for. There is over 102, might be 107 Medicaid programs in the state of Texas, okay? So you don't have to be a specialist at all of them, but if you can just navigate that website and set up your username and password and put in the information accordingly, then it'll kind of spit out um, what programs you might be available. But it is so, so important to, um, to know that everything changes when your child turns 18. So if you've done this exercise before and you have felt frustrated, you absolutely qualify for nothing. Everything changes when your child turns 18 and what you haven't qualified for, all of a sudden you start qualifying for. So don't be discouraged. 18 is coming if it's not already here. If your child is past age 18 and you didn't know, it's okay. You're not penalized for coming back to the well late. Um, you can you can still kind of go back and, and, and look at some of those things. We have some additional questions. Yes, ma'am, we did. We also had a question about getting on the STAR Plus waiver. Okay, so we're going to talk about eligibility and how to get on those those waivers in just a moment. And we'll forward those slides. Um, another one, does my daughter automatically qualify for Medicaid or CHIPS when she is born with Down syndrome? There are some presumptive, um, there are some presum presumptive things and there's like fragile, there's some, some of the preemie babies, um, there, there are some presumptive things. Now there, like one thing with SSI, SSI is presumptive for Down syndrome, but again, the income limits and Medicaid and all that kind of stuff is going to matter um, based off of the parents if it's a child. Um, but there are a number of different Medicaid programs um, that may be available, and it just depends on the severity. A lot of Down syndrome kids have heart issues and other things like that, so it just depends. Um, but again, you know, there, the presumptive list, and you can and you can use that word when you're kind of googling as far as presumptive is concerned. But um, Down syndrome is presumptive in a lot of scenarios. And then the last one I have so far is, is there a place to go that will help you get the benefits, like a lawyer's office or maybe getting in contact with you? Yeah, we work with families all the time. I think that that's kind of one of the differences of, of the firm and kind of what we, what we do. But we do work with families all the time on um, advising them what's available out there, how to go about applying for things. A lot of times people feel overwhelmed. There's so much to be thinking about, whether it's Medicaid, whether it's SSI, whether it's waivers. Um, some of our families, um, the parent is already retired, so we might be talking about SSDI or RSDI. And so absolutely, we can help with those types of things. Um, so the next waiver is our deaf blind with multiple disabilities. And so I want to talk about that because there's kind of this misnomer of if you're deaf or if you're blind, um, but it's deaf and blind with multiple disabilities um, or, you know, have a related condition that, re um, that also leads to deaf um, blindness and, and have another disability. So, so the main thing is deaf blind with multiple disabilities, intellectual disability, IQ of 70 or below, might, um, it, it could be any other disability. Um, so there's fewer people that qualify for this because they don't meet all of those criteria. We've got the Home and Community-Based Services. This is HCS. This gives services and supports to children and adults with intellectual disability or related condition who live with their families in their own homes or in small group homes with no more than four people. Then we've got the Medically Dependent Children's Program, MDCP. Um, this is where some of um, your children may qualify for um, for Medicaid and they wouldn't otherwise, but this is basically um, services to children um, that are that are 20 and younger who are medically fragile as an alternative to receiving services in a um, nursing facility. And again, some of this, um, some of those preemies or some of those um, instances where children are born or in the, they're in the hospital for a very, very long time, they may qualify for this. And it, it's going to, the long-term qualification, if the child gets better, if they, if they don't have the uh, medical, medically fragile status anymore, it is possible that they can lose this one. Okay. 
All right. Oh, Star yeah, Plus. Really quick, Allison, we had one. Sure. What, what website did you say was helpful for Medicaid waiver programs? It's, it's the HHS website. Health and Human Services is basically what that stands for. Texas Health and Human Services. Um, and that's that's for Medicaid, and you can. There's a lot of information out there. And then there was the other website was Navigate Life Texas to read a little bit more about each one of these um, these waiver programs. And today, after today's presentation, I do have a spreadsheet. It's like 24 pages long of the different um, the different waivers that are available in Texas and what the qualifications are. And this was actually put out by the state. It has not been updated since 2018. So it's not me giving you something outdated. It's still the one that they have out there. Um, but I am going to share that with you guys as well. So you can look at that. And I just want to add real quick to our audience. There are people asking for those websites. If you can give me until the very end to put that information in there, it's hard for me to monitor the chat, the questions, and search the internet for those website addresses, but I will put them in at the end. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. You know, and actually, you know what we can do, Christy? Um, we can include those in the email that we send out today um, with everybody. We'll just include those, uh, a link to those in the email, so that way they have it all together. They don't even have to copy and paste it out of the chat box. That'll be fine. Perfect. Thank you, Allison. I appreciate it. Okay. So we've got this um, Star Plus. Um, HCBS, this gives services uh, to adults over the age of 21 to keep them in their community and not in a nursing home facility. Again, a lot of these waivers are designed to, to provide um, help and services to a family who are keeping their, their loved one in, in the home or community-based services. Texas Home Living, this is gonna give services to children and adults with an intellectual disability or related condition who live in their own home or their family's home. A lot of the waivers in the state of Texas, what they're basically looking for as far as qualification is an IQ of 70 or below or 75 and below with multiple disabilities. Now, let's talk about that. A lot of people think, okay, well, I'm hanging, I'm getting off now. That's not us. That's not where we are. Our, our IQ is far greater than that or whatever. Uh, the the thing the thing that we got to talk about here is that as far as coming up on the list and and being eligible eligible for one of these waivers, um, the eligibility is looked at at the time that you come up on the list, not that the not the time that you put a, a, your your loved one on the list. Um, and so, whether regardless of what their IQ is, if they have, you know, disabilities, multiple disabilities, go ahead and put them on the, on the list um, because you never know how things will change in time. Um, we've, we've actually seen people that were over the IQ threshold that had some kind of traumatic event or had some kind of mental illness diagnosed on top of their other diagnoses that they already had later, and then the IQ changed. So, so just don't don't look at that too much because, like I said, the eligibility is at the time that you come up on the list. The Yes Waiver, um, Youth Empowerment Services. Um, so this again is the Yes Waiver. I like to talk about this waiver, um, and the reason I like to talk about it is because one, a lot of people don't know about it or that it even exists. And two, in most counties in the state of Texas, um, there are not waiting lists for this, okay? So most of the waivers that we're talking um, to you about today, unfortunately, the, 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 the timeline of how long it's going to take to actually get a waiver in Texas, I would say anywhere from 12 to 15 years. We have heard of other people being on the list for 17 years, and I'm not the keeper of the list and don't get to decide how, how, quick, it, how quick it goes. But that the, the reality of the situation is, is unless there's major change, it's slow. It's many, many, many years um, before a person's gonna come up on this list. So that's why it's really, really important to get your loved one on the list sooner versus later and if you have a child that is, was recently diagnosed or recently born with a disability, get them on as soon as possible um, with the idea that maybe by the time they turn 18 that they're um, you know, going to be coming close to the, the end of the list or being um, able to be offered services. But so the reason the yes waiver um, is a pretty awesome waiver is, you know, in the pandemic, what we've seen is um, 
a lot of people, a lot of people in our community that, you know, the disability with kids with disabilities, they've struggled, right, with um, online learning, with the, this isolation, with, with the pandemic, and some that had, um, you know, mental health issues prior to this have been, you know, escalated, okay, so this is a wraparound program. It's home and community-based services to children under the age of 19 with serious mental, emotional, and behavioral difficulties. Now, and that typically for the YES waiver needs to be the primary, like they primarily have mental, serious mental health and emotional and behavioral difficulties, not the underlying diagnosis of something like, for instance, somebody mentioned Down syndrome earlier. If there's something, the primary diagnosis is... Um, is not the mental health and there's other issues um, surrounding their original diagnosis. This might not be a way um, the waiver for you, but it is easy to check out. It's a good program. Um, it usually lasts about a year and they have a number of different services um, that are in included various types of therapy. It could be, um, it could be art therapy, music therapy, equine therapy. They have, um, they have a kind of a one-on-one -on -one person that they work with and there's a family liaison um, to help mend some of the things that have happened as a result of some of the things. But what you should think about is think about the alphabet soup um, with emotional, ODD, ADD, ADHD, BPD for borderline personality disorder, bipolar, anxiety, depression, kids that have, um, and these are not all like they have to have all of them, one or the other, um, kids that have had some of the um, the oppositional defiance, maybe they've run away um, on a pretty regular basis. Maybe they have substance uh, abuse issues, uh, drug use issues. Maybe they've been kicked out of school or they've been in trouble um, with law enforcement. All of these things are things that um, the YES waiver might be appropriate for. So then we have uh, the Community um, First Choice. And the Community for First Choice is a newer one. This is going to allow states to provide home and community-based attendance services and supports to Medicaid recipients and um, with disabilities, help with activities of daily living, um, health-related tasks, hands-on assistance and supervision, cueing, and it's basically um, helping them, you know, how they can learn to care for themselves and be a little bit more independent. Um, Christy, are we, uh, are you ready for some questions? Yes, ma'am. I do have one. Let me scroll back up and find it. Will my joint savings account with my 20-year-old son be counted against him for Medicaid slash SSI purposes? So if his name is on it, then yes, that's going to be counted um, for SSI purposes, for Medicaid purposes. And basically what we want to make sure, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this in a little bit, is we want to make sure that there's not more than $2,000 in that child's name. So that, that is the basic premise is no more than $2,000 in the child's name. Uh, and if there is, there are some ways um, that you can go about having money in the right buckets that will preserve their eligibility. And we will definitely talk about that. Um, and there's another one here that is very in-depth with a lot of information. Um, I don't know that I would feel comfortable sharing with the group. So do you, how do you want me to handle that? Cut and paste and send you can, it to you? You can, yeah, copy and paste that and send it to me in an email um, and with the contact information for that person and we'll, we'll reach out to them directly. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Let me check. I just had a couple of others come up or a couple of other notifications come up. Um, could children who are in a communications classroom or a life skills classroom be eligible for the YES waiver? Most have an autism and speech impairment eligibility through the school system. So that is going to be individualized by the county. And I think it doesn't cost you anything to apply to see. I would say that it kind of depends on the level of um, autism. If you're dealing with low functioning autism, um, I would say, you know, at, at least in the greater Houston and Fort Bend County, Harris County areas, um, historically, the low functioning um, has not necessarily been a good fit, 
but it, it costs you nothing. It costs you nothing to apply, to find out, to see if it would be a good fit, to see how they could help. Um, and so I think it would be worth checking it out for sure. And then the last one we have is um, how do they um, get the YES program uh, services information? Where do they go to fill out that form? Okay, we're going to have this in the slide coming up. So we'll have that. Uh, I'm going to go in depth with that because that's um, really confusing to a lot of people. And we actually are going to have a little um, a link in this presentation where you can copy and paste and put your zip code and it's going to basically tell you where you need to go. So it's different all over the state depending on what county you're in. So we will definitely go there. That's a great question. Um, and then CFC used to be able to be paired with other waivers and services. Is it different now? That is a good question, and I do not know the answer to that. I know that this is a precursor to some of the other waivers, but typically, um, like with people switching from Texas Home Living to HCS or vice versa, or switching around from class, we've seen some switching of waivers. I've not seen someone getting um, multiple waivers at the same time. I guess it would be possible to be getting the yes waiver, but I don't know the answer to that, but I'll definitely check that out. Um, can someone be placed on a wait list prior to moving into the state? I haven't seen that and, and waivers and interest lists don't transfer. So like if you're like living in California and you're getting a waiver and things are good and you move to Texas, just because you are getting a waiver in California doesn't mean you're getting a waiver in Texas. In fact, you're not getting a waiver in Texas. You're going to the bottom of the list. Um, and as far as I know, you have to be a Texas resident to be able to put somebody on the list. You can't not be a, um, uh, not be a resident of the state of Texas to be on that interest list. Because honestly, if they were living in any other state, then they don't qualify for the Texas waiver anyway. So I just want to make a couple of announcements, um, Allison. Yes, because we had a lot of people asking. Yes, this is being recorded. Um, yes, you will have access to that. Um, if you have specific questions that involve a lot of personal information, um, please um, note that I will copy and paste that and send that directly to Allison because I don't feel comfortable per, uh, providing that information to everybody. So if you do ask a question that has a lot of information, no, it still will be addressed by Allison. All right, I think we're all caught up. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. So services available in all waivers, adaptive aids, financial management services, supported employment, employment assistant, minor home modifications, respite care, and services in all but MDCP, um, because the children's Medicaid includes already uh, professional therapies such as OT, PT, et cetera, um, unlimited prescriptions, dental, and nursing. Um, some additional um, uh, services are transportation, residential services, equine therapy, dayhab, and nursing. So these are some of the things. Um, again, you know, you may have friends. Um, we tend to have friends with kids with disabilities, um, and maybe you have a friend that's already getting a waiver, and they're getting so many attendant hours per week, where an attendant comes into their um, to their home and um, provide services. They might get respite hours. Um, and they, another example is all different kinds of therapy. There's been massage therapy, equine therapy, music therapy, art therapy, all kinds of different therapies are also um, maybe covered under the waiver as well. But again, it's, it's, it's there to provide services to the family so that way um, we can prevent uh, institutionalizing your loved one or putting them in, in, in a res residential care facility. That's what they're designed for. Okay, waiver general um, eligibility. So we already talked about the bottom here that it's not determined until an individual comes to the top of the list. So, um, you know, because of the, the Texas interest list is so long, like I said, um, it's not for you to decide whether or not your child is going to qualify or not Just get them on the list. If they, you know, if, they, if they've got disabilities, whatever the severity may be, they have learning disabilities, it could be any a number of diagnoses, get them, go ahead and get them on the list. Most waivers for all ages, MDCP and STAR Plus are the exceptions. 
Um, the financial eligibility for all waivers, except, except for Texas Home Living, is 300% of SSI. So SSI for 2022 is 841 a month. So your income limits for your waiver eligibility. So if you're getting a waiver, how much income can they have coming in? It can't be more than 2523 uh, per month. And there's a such thing as earned income and there's a such thing as unearned income. Okay. So um, any benefits that they've got coming through um, from SSDI or RSDI or SSI is going to be unearned income and earned income is just that if they are working and earning um, money that is going to be earned income. This is not look at parental income. So this is a good thing. But individuals must meet the functional um, criteria for that specific waiver. And again, like I said, a lot of them are going to be that IQ of 70 or below, um, which is considered intellectual disability in the, in the state of Texas, or 75 and below um, with multiple disabilities. So interest list, wait list, what we've been talking about. This is a first come, first serve. It's statewide. We say it can be as long as 14 years. We're being very nice here. We're being very polite. What we're hearing um, in the in the backgrounds is that it's much longer than 14 years right now. A few years ago, it was frozen for a few years. It's not frozen anymore. There is um, a lot of movement. In fact, in the last year or so, um, I've seen a lot of movement on that list. So do be encouraged that it is moving and things are moving in the right direction. Um, these waivers are designed to promote independence, to provide some help, and again, it's going to prevent or divert individuals from institutions. Um, it will also address crisis, and we're going to talk about crisis um, in just a moment. Um, and so also, if we've got a loved one that is in a residen residential living facility or um, you know, are institutionalized, this will help the individual move um, and transition out of institutions. Okay, so this is a good slide. If, uh, if you can't wait for the email, we're going to send this to you, like I said, and you're going to have all of this, but this is where you need to go and how you need to get yourself on the list, okay? So um, what is a LIDA or LIDA? Who even knows? If somebody knows, is it LIDA or is it LIDA? Uh, Local Intellectual and De Developmental Disability Authority. You can call it whatever you want. We don't care as long as you know, um, as long as you know what it is. So your local intellectual disability, uh, developmental disability authority, it's in your county. So your local authority is in each of your counties and it is separated by counties, okay? So this is that website that I was talking about that you can um, basically copy and paste and um, it's gonna ask you your zip code and it's going to tell you who exactly your local authority is, okay? So um, when you're getting yourself on these waivers, HCS, Texas Home Living, Community First Choice, you're gonna call your local authority to get on those lists. Well, oftentimes people call their local authority and they say, I'm on all the lists. They said, I'm on all the lists. Well, you're on all the lists that they control, but they don't control MDCP class, the DBMD or the star plus waiver, right? So there is a separate phone number for the, the, the three above. And that's the number that you can call to get on that list and, or check your status on where you are on that list. And then there is also a number for the star plus waiver um, below. So I guess my big advice here would make, make sure that your child is on all the list, not just the ones that the local authority controls. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I always kind of, I, I kind of laugh about this because I don't understand why we're so behind the times. It's kind of interesting to me that in order to get on the list, you literally have to call your local authority and tell them that you would like to be put on the list and you're going to talk to somebody live and they're going to, you know, put you on the list. There is no um, website where you can put yourself on the list. There is no website where you can create a username and password and check in to see where your child is on the list. If you want to know where your child is on the, on the list, you literally have to call back to your local authority and ask them where they are on the list. Most people call every year or two to see where their kids are. Um, your local authority is supposed to reach out to you every two years um, to verify um, that you still want to be on the list. 
Uh, it is super, super important that if you move, if you move out of the county, you can have your tra- your case transferred from the local authority of the county that you were in to the county that you're moving to. So you need to notify them. But if your address changes, your phone number changes, your email changes, any of that information changes, you need to update your local authority because if they make multiple attempt, attempts over a, a couple of year period and they don't get you, they can absolutely take you off the list. So just make sure if any of those changes happen that you are definitely updating them. And hopefully one day they will have this website and it won't be dependent on one individual at the local authority answering your call to get you on the list or to check the status. How exhausting for that person at that local uh, authority of all the people that might be calling to find out where they are. It seems like the website would be a really good idea. So, um, all right, let's talk about crisis diversion. We've seen a lot more of these in the last year, again, with COVID and the pandemic and everything that we've been seeing and living and how life has changed. Um, So there are such things as crisis diversion slots, and this is basically um, if your loved one is in crisis, you can contact your local authority and tell them you would like to request an HCS crisis diversion slot. Um, So what is a crisis diversion slot anyway? Who qualifies it? Who determines what the crisis is? So what I would say here is if your child is at risk of being placed outside of the home because they are a threat to themselves or others, that would be an example of a crisis diversion slot. We've seen some families over the last couple of years um, where they had children that became very violent and, um, and the parent still had to work. The parent couldn't get any caregivers because the child was so violent. It was a, really a long story, but, um, but, you know, but that was a crisis and he actually moved up. He had only been on the list for maybe a year and mo- moved up and actually did get a slot. <clears throat> Another example of a crisis is, um, so say that you are a caregiver for your loved one and you're diagnosed with something horrible and you're going, undergoing treatment and there is nobody else. So your child is at risk of being placed outside of the home. Um, the death of one parent um, that was providing care services or things like that. Those are all things that could be considered a crisis um, and you may qualify. So the first thing first, where you're going to start is your local authority. Um, And, you know, across the state, some local authorities are really great. Some of them are really understaffed or they have high turnover of staff. Um, and so sometimes we hear that people are not, um, they're not responded to when they are requested, a, um, when they're requesting a crisis diversion slot. There are crisis lines at all of the local authorities. Um, so start, always start there. And if you are not getting the help that you need, you can also reach out to the ARC of Texas. Um, the, the ARC of Texas, you can reach out to them and they've been helpful in getting some, um, some crisis slots. Uh, approved. And then uh, thirdly, there is, um, there's an organization, it's like a, a, a not a nonprofit. Uh, it's out of Austin, and it's called Every Child, but they have boots on the ground on every major, um, you know, when I say major, Austin, Dallas, San Antonio, Houston, major areas across the state. Um, and so every child, they also help with crisis diversion slots and getting those pushed through. They'll work with your local authority. If your local authority is not being cooperative um, or you're not getting through, then they will work um, and, and, and work with them and help, help you get that pushed through. So you do have options, even if you have been denied or um, haven't you know, made, made any progress with your local authority. Um, then we have this PASRR, Diversion and Transition from Nursing Facilities and or Specialized Services. This is not one that we talk about a lot. We don't hear more of people in the nursing facilities. We hear of families needing help, um, again, for home and community-based services, which is where they believe that is in the best interest of your loved one. Um, Chrissy, how are we on questions? We've got a couple here. Um... So I have one that came in from a um, mom. She is the primary caregiver. Uh, Her son is three, has autism. She has rheumatoid arthritis and wants to know um, 
how do we do these things work when two of the individuals in the family unit are disabled? Are you speak? Is she speaking of of the the crisis diversion? No, I think this is probably going back to so maybe some of the information that you were providing earlier. So I think um, I think what we'll do is we'll I mean it is possible to have kids. Um, I've I've got clients right now that have um, two kids with disabilities and two kids on waivers. They've actually were on the um, interest list for a very very long time and they actually have qualified for. For waivers so that is possible now where things change um, and that's a whole nother topic but where things change is social security or rsdi benefits if you have more than one disabled person in the household so usually you know your kids can draw off of a parent's record once you are retired or disabled we'll talk more about that um, and so it does reduce, there's a household maximum, I guess is what I should say. Um, so as far as the Social Security Administration is concerned, there is a such thing as a household maximum, so you can be affected that way. Um, we have another one about um, uh, a child was being denied for SSI and SSDI. Where can they go for help now? Okay, and that is something um, that we can definitely help with. We are nationally so, um, certified as social security advisors. Um, it is not uncommon to get denied, um, but, but usually there's some very common reasons of why the denial may have occurred. Um, it can be silly things like uh, they sent for medical records from your doctor and your doctor never responded. Uh, it could be that the child is now 18, but child support is continuing post age 18, and that child support has been imputed to the child as income. That's a common reason that we see. Um, and uh, another thing is they could have more than $2,000 in their name. So if they have more than $2,000 in their name, and I mean anything, I mean, if grandma and grandpa bought them um CDs or um, savings bonds when they were babies and you forgot about them and it sends them over the $2,000, that could be a reason, but we can help you. Um, so the bottom line is, is one thing that I just want to be super clear on is on, on any letters that you're getting from the Social Security Administration, the top of the letter, sometimes they're confusing. So one is going to say Supplemental Security Income SSI. The other one is going to say Social Security or Social Security Disability. They're not the same. So you can't treat them as the same. The letters look the same, but at the top, they distinguish themselves. So pay attention to that. <clears throat> also, if you get any letters from the Social Security Administration and they've made a decision about something, you have 60 days to appeal. Do not put this on the shelf. Do not ignore that timeline. And when you get that late letter, you pretend like it's hot and get that appeal in um, promptly, okay? So the Social Security Administration offices have been closed due to the pandemic since the pandemic started. Um, they are only meeting by phone. They're not meeting in person unless it's an emergency and an example of an emergency like we, we knew of a family that the mom uh, and the, the mom and the dad basically died and there were four children and the grandparents were taking the kids. And so that was an emergency and they opened the office and they actually saw them. Um, so it's a very, very limited basis. Uh, we have another we, one. We have, I just wanted to say we have an entire, <clears throat> entire presentations on, um, on uh, SSI in Medicaid, SSDI, RSDI, and at the, um, I guess it's this week, but we actually do have a presentation coming up with um, the uh, community liaison specialist with the Social Security Administration this week. We have multiple presentations with him, um, and lately it's been monthly, so that will be a good one to be on uh, th this coming week. Um, does former foster care status grant eligibility to any of the waivers regardless of income? Can you read that to me one more time, please? I didn't hear you. Does former foster care status grant eligibility to any of the waivers regardless of income? So as far as the waivers are concerned, you always have to maintain Medicaid eligibility for waivers. So whether or not a foster child is going to um, qualify for a waiver right off the bat and, and like move up on the list, I'm not familiar with that one. One thing that I do know in the state of Texas is that um, 
uh, the foster care kids that were um, in the foster care system through the state of Texas, or if you have adopted um, through the state of Texas, like foster system, um, those kids do go to college in the state of Texas for free. So that's something good to know um, that they ab absolutely do go to college for free. Um, does a change in the county change where they are on the list or is it just to make sure they have correct contact information? It's just to make sure that they have correct um, contact information and know they don't get moved off one list to another, but you do change your local authority and who you talk to um, going forward. Um, and kind of going back to the one question you were mentioning about the SSI and appealing, um, what happens if you do not appeal in that 60 days? You typically are going to have to reapply. Um, and, and basically what you're going to have to do is call and you're going to have to schedule a phone appointment to reapply because if you've been denied and you didn't appeal within the 60 days, you cannot do it online. Typically, you can do an SSI application online. Um, but if you didn't appeal within 60 days, you got to call them back and you got to get a phone appointment. Um, and I would say call sooner versus later because the appointments are scarce. Um, it's taking some people a couple of months to get in uh, for a phone appointment. Always, always, always call your local Social Security office, not the national number. If you call the national number, you're literally going to sit on hold for an hour. They're going to tell you that you need to talk to the local office. Then they're going to tell you that the local office has no appointments and you could call back. So just call your local office. That's, a, that's the best place to start and, and tell them that you need to schedule an appointment. Now, all local offices are not created equally. Some social security offices are very, very difficult to deal with. They're very, very slow. They're very, very behind. Um, so in the area of Dallas-Fort Worth, you may want to check around with other special needs families that have already gone through this process to learn what social security office they deal with and if they've had a good experience. And if they have, then I would start at that office. Wherever you start, you stay with the Social Security Administration. So you might want to do a little homework on that. Um, and the last one we have right now, um, actually two people asked the same question, was... Um, my child receives SSI for survival benefits since her dad passed away. I can't seem to get any other benefits for her. Uh, any way around this or suggestions as to what to do? So that's going to be very personalized depending on household income. So survivor benefits when a parent passes away, that's pretty normal. Um, RSDI for minor children, if a parent is retired or disab disabled, that's pretty normal. Um, so it just depends. Um, it really depends on the whole household situation, and that's kind of a one-off. I think we're pretty much caught up right now. Okay, perfect. I'm going to keep moving so we can get through everything. Um, so one of the questions that we ask, um, you know, that we get asked all the time is how do I get started with a special needs planner? What, you know, what is the difference or what do we, what do we do? And so um, at Consolidated Planning Group, um, really, we're focused on helping you have money in the right buckets to make sure you're going to, you know, preserve eligibility, retain eligibility for state and federally f funded programs for your loved one. Um, but your situation is specialized. You do need to work with a special needs planner to help you formulate a plan. Um, a special needs planner is similar than a, a, a regular um, a regular planner or, or an advisor from a license perspective that we have the same licenses, but we're nuanced in different things. We're national social, nationally certified as social security advisors. We're members of the special needs planning um, you know, academy. We're very, very nuanced in all things special needs, whereas your, your typical advisors, um, they understand the the the, fina the financial realm, which we do too. Again, we have all of those licenses, but you can accidentally end up with money in the wrong buckets, making um, you know <laughs> poor decisions as it relates to how you leave money, how you leave money to your heirs, and things like that. And it's just it's not that they're not smart; it's just that they're not nuanced and special needs. So if you have a, a you know a special needs loved one that may or may not, we don't know, we're still hopeful and optimistic, need care for the rest of their life, it's really, really important to, to work with a special needs planner. So we want you to understand the difference between a special needs planner and a special needs attorney. And <clears throat> in short, where the money, 
they're the paper. So when we have a child that's going to need care for the rest of their life, not just ours, it's almost like a third retirement bucket. If you're married, so we've got husband and wife, 25 to 35 years in retirement. We've got this special needs loved one that may live 25 to 30 years past our death. So we got to make sure that we, um, that we understand what the future care costs are going to be. And we are able to develop those um, future care costs and, and be able to provide those numbers. What does it look like? How much does it cost? How do we plan for this? What do we do? That's what we do. A special needs attorney, they're, they're the paper. They're the legal documents. They're the special needs trust, first party, third party, special needs trust. They're the wills, the healthcare power of attorney. Power of attorney, they are guardianship. Um, partial guardianship, supported decision-making agreements, et cetera. We work hand-in-hand -hand with attorneys all, all day long. We make referrals to qualified attorneys, but just like when it comes to your situation being specialized and you should work with a specialist, same thing when it comes to an attorney. So a planner, an attorney, you want to work with uh, a specialist. Um, all attorneys are not created equally. Uh, many, many attorneys that are adept at doing a will don't know anything about um, special needs trust and what language has to be in there. There's a UT special needs um, planning conference that the attorneys that work in special needs attend every year. The laws change. Things move. It's very, very important that your trust is set up appropriately and properly with the correct language, or it can fail to qualify as a special needs trust in the eyes of the Social Security Administration. So that's super important. So as you start planning, we want you to gather all the necessary planning documents. What does this look like? Uh, this is all of your statements, all of the information about any benefits that you have, health insurance, disability, long-term care, life insurance. These are um, 403Bs, 401Ks, um, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, brokerage statements, wills, trust, um, guardianship. Those are basically uh, the planning documents, social security statements, and earning records. Um, so that's kind of how we get started with that. One of the things that we talk to our families about is developing a letter of intent. Um, a letter of intent, we have a complete webinar on this on what a letter of intent is and why you should have one. I like to call it a family love letter to your to your family members. We eat, sleep, and breathe our children. We know them backward and forward. We know what makes them tick. We know what makes them you know fall apart. Um, but what if you were incapacitated today or no longer here on this earth? What we have found is that even families um, where the spouse, maybe your caregiver and the spouse is working outside of the home, that sometimes even the spouse doesn't know uh, the level of detail that the caregiver knows. Um, so this letter of intent is all things your loved one. Where were they born? What schools have they attended? What are their primary diagnoses, secondary diagnosis? What meds do they take? What allergies do they have? What are your re religious preferences? Um, everything about it. a letter of intent, we have actually a template for it. It's 20 pages long. Um, it can take you some time to do this, but it, if you want your intentions known that if something happens to you and you can't speak, um, you can't, you know, deliver this information. This is a document that somebody else, the future caregiver that would be stepping into your shoes could hopefully step into your shoes and, and not um, be as complicated as it, um, you know, as it could be without this information. We also want you to think about how your vision, um, you know, how you hope your vision is going to be not only for, for you, but you and your special needs child. But I want to say you first, okay? So, Oftentimes, as parents, we're always putting our kids first. It's always the kids first. We're always thinking about the kids and the next best thing for the kids. Um, <clears throat> when we have a loved one that's going to need care for the rest of their life, not just the rest of our life, and they're not going to get up and out of the house and graduate college at 22, 23, 25, they're going to be with us forever. You know, we work our adult lives um, with the vision of retirement and the, the future and so there has to be balance. There has to be some respite in there built in for you. There has to be some um, of your own goals and um, what you wanted to do in retirement when you're looking at the vision and having some sort of balance. Um, how are we on, on questions, Christine? We are good. We've had a couple that have asked about particular information for fees and working with you guys, but I figured you can address that later. Um, uh, unless you're addressing it in your slides. 
Well, we'll address it at the end. And then this slide is um, probably one of the um, most needed slides of this presentation. So for the sake of um, getting through it, we're going we're gonna to talk about that for right now. And then the last one um, is, do you have any planners that are Spanish speakers? We do not at this time. I apologize. Okay, we get that question a lot. We need to. Okay. For sure. <laughs> All right. We're caught up. Um, Keep going. <laughs> okay. So how will my child's care be funded? Okay. So we've been talking about waivers and we're switching gears a little bit. So we're talking about SSI and Social Security. So let me give you a little schooling right here. SSI. Supplemental Security Income, SSI. This is a means-based program. So you have to be disabled and indigent. And indigent means um, less than $2,000 assets to the child's name if they're over 18. Um, and if they are, um, and, and if they're under 18, it's less than $2,000 assets in your name if you're single, $4,000 assets in your name if you're married, if they're under 18. So SSI is a means-based program, disabled and indigent is what SSI is. Right now it's 841 a month plus Medicaid. So 841 a month is what comes in and Medicaid. Okay, so a lot of times people say my child's getting social security when actuality is that they're getting SSI, they're really not getting social security. The only way your child is getting S Social Security, also known as SSDI, um, Social Security Disability Retirement Survivors Disability Income, the only way your child is getting that is A, if you or their father are either already retired or disabled, B, you or their father are, uh, not obviously not you, but their, their other parent is deceased, um, or C, they have worked and they have paid enough in to the system to be able to um, draw social security disability, okay? So social security SSDI is a worker-based program. So if your child has never worked, they have not paid into the program. But the reason all this stuff is very, very important is your child has, an, has the ability to to be considered under your record, a parent's record. Um, so basically, if the child's disability started prior to age 22, then basically you prove that to the Social Security Administration and they can be considered for childhood disability benefits. And what that means is typically most families, their parent is still working when the child turns 18, they're at least working for a few more years. So the child is disabled, he's indigent, he's getting SSI and Medicaid. Well, then a few years later, dad retires and turns on his social security. If your child's approved for childhood disability benefits, they're entitled to 50% of the parent's record. So in the example that your social security benefit is $3,000 a month, and you either retire or become disabled on uh, through the Social Security Administration, your child is going to be eligible up to 50%. Well, it's 50% of your record. So if you're getting $3,000, your child is entitled to $1,500. They'll switch over from SSI to SSDI or RSDI. And then after two years, they're going to be eligible for Medi Medicare. So SSI comes with Medicaid. Social Security after two years comes with Medicare. And due to the pickle amendment, if you qualified for SSI and Medicaid first, and then you switch over to S Social Security Disability, um, RSDI or SSDI, and otherwise would not qualify for Medicaid because you make too much, the pickle amendment will allow you to keep Medicaid. I know that's a mouthful. We have an entire presentation on this. So SSI, and then you've got SSDI, Social Security, RSDI, it's all in the same. So Social Security is a worker-based program. SSI is a means-based program. Um, but basically, the, the disability matters as well. So there's places that you can have, um, you can have assets over the $2,000. Um, basically, is a special needs trust um, for their future care. So this is going to be a third party special needs trust. You can have an unlimited amount of money in a special needs trust for your loved one with special needs. So that is one place that you can have money outside of a regular bank account, whether you're as a parent, you're on the bank account or it's just in the child's name, doesn't matter, still $2,000. 
um, one of the things that people ask us all the time is how do we fund, you know, future care? If the future care costs are estimated at thousands, uh, millions of dollars, how do we fund that? And while it's true, a lot of families do have um, assets and they're affluent and they, you know, they, they fund the trust. Maybe there's been an inheritance from a grandparent or things like that. We see that as well. But oftentimes life insurance um, is basically what is going to fund the trust in the future. So the trust is open. It's funded with $5. And upon your death or the pa other parent's death, life insurance funds the trust. Okay. So the next place that you can have money above and beyond the $2,000 for SSI is an ABLE account. It's under the, fi the, the tax code 529A. Uh, they just increased the contributions for 2022. You can contribute 16,000 per year, an additional 12,880 if working. Disability must have began prior to 20, um, age 26. This is like a 529C, only the individual with the disability is the account owner. You can never have more than $100,000 in an ABLE account before it disqualifies you for SSI. So you do need to spend it down, but it acts like a 529C. Um, the money grows uh, tax-free as long as it's used. If it can be construed as achieving a better life for an individual with a disability, you can basically pay for it out of an ABLE account. So that's what you need to know with that. And again, we have entire presentations on that. So I know we are running out of time. So we've kind of talked about a lot of things um, today, but um, basically these are some of the things that should be on your radar. We talked about our waivers and interest list today. If you don't have a future care cost estimate for your loved one, what it's going to look like um, to, to fund future care for your loved one, we can help with that. Um, we also develop comprehensive special needs care plans uh, for families. And um, as, as the Social Security Advisors, we have specialized software. So if you are a caregiver, if there's like a, a it's a one income household, we've got multiple kids with disabilities. Um, any, all these uh, different antiquated scenarios that might be, we have a specialized social security software that helps us um, determine how and when you should pull the trigger on benefits for you and your loved one. And what does that mean dollars and cents to you as far as the difference of waiting versus turning it on? Um, beneficiary designations are a very, very big thing that we talk about on a pretty regular basis. Bottom line is, is your special needs child should not be named directly as a beneficiary on anything you have. Um, it should be the special needs trust. And this is something that's free and fixable. All you need to get is a change of beneficiary form. If you've done this, you're not alone. Um, usually 95% of um, people that we talk to have named their kids as beneficiaries. So that's a big one. Um, directing child support to a first party special needs trust. If um, in the state of Texas, they like child support to continue post age 18. If that's you, that child support needs to be directed to a first party special needs trust, or it is going to be used against them uh, for SSI purposes. Um, so um, guardianship, power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney, supported decision making, entire webinars on our um, YouTube channel for that. And, um, and, and we also recommend, so if you're thinking about like transition programs for your loved one, we definitely recommend start um, touring, touring residential living, transition programs, all those different types of things early because the waiting list can be very, very long. Um, I always like to say, I just want to introduce my team to everyone. I do not work alone. It is not Allison Scalberg and company, definitely Consolidated Planning Group. And I work on an awesome team. Um, so you are subject to, to work with any one of us, but we work collaboratively. So, um, whatever cases we're on, we are all, all together on from a collaborative basis. As far as how to reach us, how do we work? Um, we always, um, offer free personalized consultations. So if you've had questions on here that were kind of personal, you didn't want to post, or they were too detailed to, um, to go over um, in, the, in the meeting, you can certainly um, reach out to us and, and schedule an initial consultation. We've got our contact um, information. You can take a picture um, of that little scan code, and then you can set an appointment directly. You can follow our Facebook and our YouTube channel. Um, like I said, all those webinars live out there. Uh, there's no charge for the YouTube channel. You can um, come and go as you please and listen to whatever you want. Um, and during our initial meeting, we're going to talk to you um, uh, uh, and really just learn a little bit more about the planning that you've done so far. 
We're not here to rain on any great planning that you've already done. Um, and we're going to talk to you about the doors that you can walk through with Consolidated Planning Group, how we work. Um, and we have various, various options, and it just depends on where you are in the planning process and the one that might be right for you. But we'll talk to you directly about that for sure. Um, and that's all I've got, Christy. Um, I know that we're right over time, and I don't know if you want to take any other questions, or um, everybody can just reach out to me directly if they have any additional questions that we weren't able to answer. Well, we only have a couple of other questions that I see. One was um, making regular deposits versus do, do they have to be a lump sum when you're talking about the special needs planning trusts? Does it matter if it's yeah. regular or not? You can make regular deposits. You can make lump sum. Same thing with the ABLE. Um, as setting up an ABLE account, you could set up a systematic um, a systematic, you know, payment plan into an ABLE account. It does not have to be a lump sum. And um, anybody can contribute to a special needs trust or an ABLE account. So if we've got grandparents that want to give money to grandkids or things like that, anybody can contribute, including the individual themselves. Um, and everything else I see is a lot of asking questions about, you know, your individual getting appointments, individual fees, that kind of thing. Um, so another one that I ran across is what is the relationship between Medicaid eligibility versus SSI eligibility? Um, yeah. So basically it's $2,000. I mean, it's basically the same as far as the assets are concerned of the assets that you can have in your, in your name is no more than $2,000. You can have one house, you can have one car. There has been exceptions for a family that has two cars. If the other car is super, super old and, and you say that you would sell it and use it for final expenses, that's one way or if it's super, super old, or you owe a ton of money on it, that sometimes they'll make an exception for the two cars, but it's basically one house and one car. And it's not one house and one car and land that is undeveloped, that's over, <laughs> you know. So, and you know, it, it, if you own any more than one, the one house and the one car, then, then, um, then you basically won't qualify, or over $2,000, you won't qualify for SSI. And Most Medicaid. of the other comments that are coming in are, thank you, Allison, for all the great information, um, wanting to get in touch with you, which they have your contact information here um, on your slide. We're going to be sending out the PowerPoint, also the YouTube channel. They can get your information there. Um, what I'm going to do to wrap things up for my end is post a put a poll out there for feedback. Um, if you would take a few minutes, four questions, a couple seconds to do that, I would appreciate it. <clears throat> so I'm going to launch that poll real quick. And it looks like most of the other questions um, or comments are just complimentary saying thank you for all the great information. Um, asking for contact information, which we'll also be putting that back up um, when we get the, or when you will, they will. Woo, it's time for my lunch. My brain is freezing here. Um, <laughs> they will be getting all of your slides and your contact information when we send them the uh, PowerPoint presentation along with the recording on your Facebook page. Um, everything else looks good, Allison. And um, Christy, we have sent, um, we sent you an email with the PDF of the presentation. And also that um, that um, spreadsheet that I was talking about about all the waivers. It was like 24 pages long. We, we've sent you an email with that um, with that information. So um, we'll, we look forward to connecting. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. It's been a pleasure, and um, and we um, hope to be back with you again soon. Thanks and so much. For pe people who are still with us, if you had a question that I missed, I do apologize. It was not done on purpose. Um, it was hard to keep track, track of the chat and the Q&A. So please, you can submit that question to me and I can forward it to Allison or you have Allison's contact information. Um, please uh, contact her directly um, or send them through me. It doesn't matter. Either way, we can get your question answered. Bye, Allison. Sounds Thank good. you. Th Thank you. Bye now.
Um, Amber, I see your question in the chat. Um, we, when you registered, you should have included your uh, email and your registration. So we have that. If you did not include your email and your registration, then please add that. We have everyone's email when they register, they sh you should have included your email. So we have everyone's email and we will send out the information that Allison sent to us um, and we will get that out to you. If you did not include your email in your registration, then please make sure you do so here in the chat. And thank you for spending your lunch time with us. Um, please uh, feel free to reach out to me. My contact information is also in the chat. Um, or was at the beginning of the presentation. Um, I am your regional coordinator here, or one of the regional coordinators here um, for Partners Resource Network, and will be happy to assist you in any way that I can. I noticed some of you still posted questions in the Q&A. Um, she did not answer the question about fees. Um, the rest of the questions, we will make sure that we get to her um, so that she can answer or that I can send you the answers. Um, I do know she covered a lot of information in a quick amount of time, but remember that this presentation is recorded and is going to be on their um, Facebook, or excuse me, their YouTube channel. Um, we also stream this live on our Facebook uh, page, Packed Project on Facebook, so you can go back and watch this presentation again. Um, and check out some of their other presentations on um, their website. I'm going to hang around for just a few more minutes. I still, I see we have some participants who are still here, um, potentially answer any questions that might come up, give you a few seconds to um, you know, answer or fill out the workshop evaluation. 